Welcome to another episode on Family Business Legacies here on Regital TV channel. I'm joined by a superb guest, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, most people in Dubai, UAE will know who he is. Uh, he's an icon here uh, in, in the business world. For those of you watching internationally, hopefully you get a chance to find out a bit more about him and his family business legacy. Roger, I'm not going to waste any time. It's a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Uh, you've got a rich history here. Maybe you could give us a few insights of where it all started when it comes to your family business legacy, you know, from your grandfather and your father, and where did it start and how did you end up in, in Dubai? Sure. Um, so our family was basically um, moved to Dubai from India, which was the Pakistan side of India now. And they came here in the 40s. And the company, which is a family company called Regal, has been officially established here since 1952. Mm. My grandfather had come here uh, setting up the offices because of the partitioning yes. in the 40s when they were looking at the turmoil in, the, in India at that time. They had to move the families away from, we were near Karachi, and he had to take the family and go away to India. So what he did is he sent the eldest, eldest son mm. to take the family to India and he came abroad here to set up shop here. They were already in the business of export from uh, near Karachi. We were, there's a small port called Gwadar. And they used to have a base there. Mm. And the ships used to basically go from Bombay, Karachi, Gwadar, go to Salala in Oman, mm. and up to Muscat, up to Sharjah at that time, because Dubai did not have a deep sea port. Right. And then move on all the way up to the, up to Basra. Mm. So he was already in that, in that route and they knew about the cities and what yes. was the trade uh, in these areas. And when this turmoil started happening with the partitioning, he came here to say, let me set up shop in this part of the world. And if I've got my research right, this is around 51, 52? 52. 52, yeah. Well, he, he set up shop. grandfather would have come earlier. Yeah, so he came in earlier, but, um, but the official registration of the company was in 1952. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And those were the days where there's probably, what, 50, 60,000 population. Yeah, there was a very, very uh, small city. Not even a city, a small village. Yeah. And Dubai, few people using some donkeys and camels. Absolutely. Camels and donkeys were the <laughs> yeah. mode of transport. There was no electricity. Yeah. There was no telephones. Amazing. There was hardly any 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 luxury around, it was basic, basic necessity at that time. And, and now look behind us. Right? And now Dubai is This, is, this is the transformation that's happened uh, yeah. Yeah. in Dubai in a short space of time. Absolutely. So those, those early days uh, in, the, in the garment textile related businesses. Uh, so we are yeah. family started at, uh, at that time, it was basically d demand driven, whatever the customer wants. Mm. Because what the market was, there was enough demand, there was no supply. Right. There was hardly any communication, the transportation was weak. So if you, if you had a demand, you reach out to the world and try and procure the products and sell. That happened for the first 10, 15 years of the family business. And then as and when the business grew, we started getting more and more specialized. So I think since, uh, since the sixties, we got into textiles per se. So we narrowed our focus down to textiles. What age were you when you had your first insight into the business? So I had a walk around. Your, your father grabbed your grabbed your hand and showed you around. Can you remember? I remember. I used, to, I used to walk around the office all the time because you know our our residences and our offices were not too far away. Dubai was a very small city, mm. and I would end up in the office in in my school days and what have you. But I remember very clearly when I was fourteen or fifteen years fifteen years old to mm. be specific. I had learned accounting in the office in the in school. And I wanted to see how it is in the real world. And I went to my office and I told, sat with the account guys and said, so show me what you, how do you do your debit and credit? Right. And that, that's what got me into the business. And as computers were coming in yes. at that time, and we were learning all these uh, processes on the computer, I was interested to implement it. So I actually, at the age of 16, when I was in school, started implementing the accounting package in my offices. So did you have this uh, natural affiliation with numbers and attraction towards I, I, the I accounting think, yeah. finance side yeah, of business? Yeah. Well, I'm, 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 I'm decent at numbers, yeah. but you know, at that point of time, being 16 year old, I couldn't go out and change anything in the company. I couldn't look at marketing. I couldn't look at sales because I was not a full-time employee. But this was something that was on the back end and it was very interesting for me to say, okay, there's the software, there's the hardware, and this is pretty new. And none of the people in the company knew about it or knew much about it. And there were these softwares that I was trying to play around with, and I did that and put that in the company. And, and did you get any obstacles when you, when this young kid who's uh, <laughs> thinking about improvements and innovation? No, I'm <laughs> yeah. actually I'm very lucky that my father was very open-minded. That's he, good. He did not uh, restrict my my involvement in the company, changes in the company, and he really encouraged me to come into the company and say, okay, what do you want to do? So I remember when I came and joined the family business, I started 
making changes or started implementing new ideas. All he said is, look, you know what? My, my asset is my team. As long as they're up with it, you're okay with it. But you need to treat them well. You can't just bulldoze everybody. So there's a few learnings here for the viewers. Yeah. I, I want to repeat a few things you said. It's yeah. really important. The first thing is, for those of you who are watching part of a family business already, was the encouragement that's right. from a senior member. Absolutely. You know, that's important. Sometimes senior members can block the next generation. And I know a lot of my cousins or yeah. my friends who had that, that story. Where we've always done it this way yes. or you can't do you that. Can't change this it. is what you've got to do. We don't Absolutely. want to change. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and some of those family businesses don't survive. Absolutely. Yeah, they won't get to like, in your case, third generation. They don't evolve to the next level. Then. Yeah. So that was one you mentioned. The second one uh, you mentioned in terms of a learning there. Learning is, but you know, if you want to bring in change, you need to bring the team along. Right. You can't just bulldoze the whole idea and say, this is me and I want to change it. If your team doesn't accept the change, then you're hitting a brick wall. Yes. And especially what's your opinion on, in some cases, uh, when you've got senior family members and they've had people around them a long time, yeah. 10, 15, 20, I mean, we've got case studies here in the U.S. where people have been with them for 25, 30 years. I had and when the next gen member comes along, hey, I've arrived. Yeah. You know, I've been to the best business school. Sure. Uh, where's my office, uh, dad? And uh, starts dictating. Well, I had to deal with uh, yeah. my dad's uh, general manager that time was with the company 45 years mm. already. And exactly, so you go to a business school, you learn all these new technology, new, new techniques of management, and you try and sit down with these people, and they're like, "No, we can't change. This is how we've done it, and we've been successful. Why should we change it?" Mm -hmm. And the lesson there is, how do you communicate with that team? Mm -hmm. I had a very simple thing. I remember coming back from one of these business schools and saying, "Okay, I want to do this, this, this," and my dad said, "You know what? You need to work with the team, and you need to communicate." Mm -hmm. And with this person specifically, who was the head of the company at that time, I had to sit down with him and say, look, you know, we need to make these changes. And I, this was not even in the first year or second, it was in the third year of me being in the company. So I had to wait till I earned my stripes to say, I can even suggest changes because, you know, you, you have to be kid, quite patient. You, you're Three a young years. kid, you come in and you yeah. say, okay, I want to change these things. You will lose the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Unless you want to fire the whole team and bring somebody new, but you need to know what the business is all about. I waited for three years and I had a chat with him and I said, look, you know, we need to change. If we run the business this way, we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. We need to do one, two, three, four, five, and I need you on board. Now, either you change or because you've been there for 45 years, I would like you to then have a graceful exit. And I'm not asking you to, I'm not firing you, but I'm telling you, you need to change. Otherwise, this company is not going anywhere. He said, give me a week. And he thought he would go talk to my dad. My dad was like very supportive. He said, look, He's a new incoming uh, generation. We all need to accept changes. You yes. know, either we all change or things are not going to work. Mm -hmm. And he was very graceful and he said, look, you know what? I've worked for so long. I, I need to look at retirement. I don't think I can change at this point of time. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how the things you, you're trying to implement. So why, don't, why don't I work on How did he take it? How did this GM you know, it, it, it was a shock to him, but you know, it's the communication. How do you, how do you deal with it? I did not go around yelling and shouting, saying, you know, I want this, leave this guy out, or I don't want these changes implemented right away. I sat down with him and I told him why I'm doing this. And I told yes. him all the negatives and positives, what are happening. And, uh, and he took it in the best right. And uh, believe it or not, when he left, we had a farewell party for him. He was very happy. Wonderful. He was honored. So, he, you know, so one leaves with dignity. Exactly. He was honored. It's important, isn't he it? He gave 45 yeah. years of his life to the company. Absolutely. I mean, it's his lifetime. And he did everything right for that environment for that time. I don't expect him to suddenly um, change his skill sets and say, okay, you know what? We're going to get into this new, new era and I'm going to be on board. He was very supportive. He did not leave right away. He, you know, we, we had him for another nine months or so. Yeah. And he left with pride and dignity, and that's uh, it. And, you know, that's and this sense of security as well, because if insecurity kicks in, that's true. That, that's that's true. also going to cause some issues. No, absolutely. But what what about the other way around? I mean, we, we come across case studies where that that individual will go to a senior member, whisper in their ear, and the loyalty of the family member is with the professional, with the not their own son or daughter. True. So luckily for me, it was just my father and me and the business at that point of time. And when the GM did go to my father, my father was very supportive of him and me both. He said, look, he is the incoming person. Mm. Whether you like it or not, I will have to hand over the reins to him. So let's work out this whole thing, transition together. Yes. Um, it was not that, you know, but the son has come and he's, he's, you know, he's being arrogant about the, the changes and he's trying to pull power. Mm. I worked with the team to earn the respect. I traveled with them. I, I, I was trained by them. Actually, my father did not do much of my training. It was the team. But he told me very clearly, 
you want to learn the business, you got to be with them. You got to travel with them. You got to sit in their offices. You got to be on the shop floor. And these are the people who know things on the ground. Yes. You want to know management techniques and things like that. You got to come and see me. But on the ground, if you were going to go to different divisions, which I did, from retail to wholesale to Indian thing to, um, so you rolled up your sleeves. Exactly. Yeah. Really got a pulse of what's going that, on. That is what took me three years. So in today's world, how do you how do you overcome situations where family businesses may have next gen members who don't want to roll up their sleeves? What's your views on that? Look, it's challenging. I mean, you need to know the inside of the business. If you can't become a manager uh, running a business right away without knowing the product, without knowing the customer, I would recommend the next gen to, you know, roll up the sleeves, at least spend some time on the floor. And that is where you get the insight of what the market is all about, what the customers were all about. And once you know that, then to move up to managerial level, even you will have very good management skills. So you don't need to know the product, you don't need to know your suppliers, you need to know your customers, you need to know your employees. When you work with them, when you're down there on the on the shop floor, it makes a big difference about your knowledge. Mm. And as you've progressed with your career um, as part of your family business's succession plan and taken on board more responsibility now for the group, right. you know, um, w- w- could you tell us maybe you know, any stories where there was a turning point for you, you know, a breakthrough moment in your career journey yeah. that sort of changed everything for you? to grow and develop and become the leader you are now. So, so I basically, when I first joined the family business, it was our textile business, which we were focused on. My dad had other businesses, but you know they were on JVs or they were businesses which were not uh, something that I was interested in. Yes. <clears throat> the breakthrough came is when um, I started my own business. And it was just sheer coincidence. And I always wanted to do something on my own because you stay with the family business for five, seven years and say, okay, how do I set my mark? So this, this business that I've inherited is my family business. What does it mean? What is Rajin Shroff? Mm-hmm. I um, got an opportunity at that point of time. We um, There was the satellite technology had just, just come in. You know, even B Sky B, like in the UK, was not released. Right. There was satellite TV coming out of Asia. There was some satellite TV coming out, being launched out of India. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine and I uh, were dabbling around and he told me that, look, you know, we can get this equipment and we can watch the World Cup, uh, Cup of Cricket mm-hmm. in Dubai. And I said, you're kidding me. So we, invi- we, we invested 25,000 dirhams, bought this huge 16-foot satellite dish and put it up in my house. <laughs> and believe it or not, we were the only house or, or place in Dubai where you could watch World Cup of Cricket. I think it was 84 or 85. I had 200 people in my house. Wow. And they, everybody was like, how can I get this? What can I do? Can you provide it? What year was this? 84. 84, okay. And I was like, wow. okay, this sounds like an interesting. Well, people lining up outside to get in. So yeah. I'll tell you what. <laughs> so lying up outside my house, I didn't have space. Yeah. A friend of mine who owns a hotel told me, can you give me this? And we put it in the hotel because, you know, the World Cup lasts for about uh, two months or so. Mm-hmm. He said, why don't we move this to the hotel? And why don't we do a partnership on the revenue? Mm-hmm. Sounds like a good deal, but no, let's not do that. I'll bring another one. Yeah. And I'll give you that and I'll do the partnership on that. And that's what we did. So we, I quickly went to, uh, and that time the product was coming from India. Mm. Uh, surprisingly, India was still ahead of the curve for manufacturing this product. Shipped it, aired it, and we paid a bomb because when you pay something for air freight, you know, mm. for 16 foot of dishes, it's not cheap. But nevertheless, we got it. We put it into the boardroom of the hotel and I got a cut of the, of the, of the tickets that we sold. So that was your first sort of spin off on your my, own as my an own. entrepreneur. Yeah. And I converted that into a business. And what I, what I did is right away, I set up a company called Rajkumar Communication, uh, which is now called Vigo Technologies. And we started installing satellite dishes all over the buyer. We were the first company to start doing this. Even the government authorities did not know how to Qualify this company as what? What are the other installers of satellite TV? Mm-hmm. Uh, what product is it? Because the technology was so new, nobody knew about how to. And how where to have you it. taken that business today? So, where is so that? that business has evolved. Obviously, it's come a long way. Yeah. Today, you don't see 16 foot dishes on top of roofs. <laughs> you you see uh, well until about last year, you had the 60 centimeter dishes, literally that big, and now you don't even know uh, need that because everything is through streaming and all that. So the company is now involved. It's become a, a technology integrator. So in our new project, which is the Taj and GLT, we've completely done the entire ICT in that building. Uh, so whether it is guest room management, the Wi-Fi, the security cameras, the gate access barriers, uh, the the entire security system is done. So we've evolved so to it's into great. Got it. Yeah, from these big big dishes to so the satellite TV has gone evolved also. You know, it is now technology is converging. 
what you do is you take satellite uh, uh, distribution uh, channels, you take security, you take communication, you take uh, all the other home automation, and you are now converging all into one. So it's one platform that the consumer wants to see. Very good. If you remember in the few last uh, in, in the you know, earlier days, if you had four channels to watch, you would have four satellite boxes sitting in your house. I mean, that those days are gone now. So everything is integrated into one app or one one app uh, one one system. And everybody wants to have convenience of what we'll make sure details uh, show up at the bottom here. So, you know, we talked briefly about Regal Trading right. as the legacy business, and now there's Regal Technologies, That's and right. then there's other and then there's parts of the group now. Yes. And then, then there is, uh, yeah. then. So, that was my, my moment of, of creating something that I can call mine. When you say it's mine, um, just to, to understand, uh, there's different structures out there where the next gen could spin off their own businesses and it's theirs it's got nothing to do with the family sure, sure. in other cases people do it for the f fulfillment factor yes. and to learn yes. but they know whatever they're doing is still for the family that's true w which one so the formula i used <laughs> i i did not want to split away from the family but i wanted to create my own feeling of ownership perfect and yeah. uh, but still be part of the family so so you kept the unity so i yeah. what i did is when i yeah. created when i started the company i went to my dad and I said, I need a loan to start up this company right and he gave me a loan, which I paid back in nine months. Brilliant. Um, I saw interest free, <laughs> interest free, of course. <laughs> yes, that's that's some perk that I got. Yeah. Um, so I did get a loan, mm. and I created my company. I paid back the loan to the family or to the company. However, a few a few years later, I merged my this company back into the family company. Yes, I, I don't want to keep you know my own interest because what you want is you want to align your interests. So if I'm st I'm working in textiles, I'm working in another company. It should not be that I'm giving more time to this because it's mine. And maybe for the viewers again, could, could you explain why is that important to have the understanding at the beginning? And if, if you don't, what, what could happen? Well, if you don't have the understanding, then it becomes you versus me and it becomes my pot versus the bigger pot. And depending on how big the family is, luckily my family is not that big. It's my father uh, and of course his uncle, my, his brother, which is my uncle who passed away now. And just my brother and me. Yes. So technically now we're just three of us. So between me, my brother and my father, if I did not have a clear understanding and if I had lots of cousins, say, in the business, then the confusion with every cousin is like, okay, this is my pot, I want to do this. And, you know, why is this person getting this share out of the holding company when he's not spending time right. or he's not generating revenue? If you have a clear um, family constitution or a family uh, document that details performance related mm -hmm. uh, bonuses or, owner, or or even ownership makes life easy for everybody. So Absolutely. we went through that process. We had right. to create the family constitution. I had to get my fa father involved. He's like, no, no, you guys take care of it. I said, well, you need to be on board. Mm -hmm. You need to also know what is expected from you when it comes to a situation or uh, an issue or what is our overall vision and how are we going to work? And, and why is it important to have that constitution in writing versus uh, family saying, well, we're family, you know, we know what we're doing, we, we trust each other, we don't need to do something like this. True, but things change over a period of time, more family members come in, environments change, um, appetites change. Today I might be in a position to grow the business, but my father is not in the position to, or he doesn't want to grow the business, he wants to consolidate. And then you always have this tussle of, you know, how much cash goes where and which pocket of the business do we invest money in, do we put it more into into savings and say, okay, we need to have a bigger reserve. And I, I would say, no, but I want to expand. So if you have that document, if you have that discussion, and it's not that one document that you sign and you lock it away for 30 years, sure. you've got to revisit it every few years and say, it evolves with the next gen coming absolutely. in as well. Yeah. And, and if the next gen is coming in, how do you take care of it? Events happen, you know, weddings happen and family members gets added. You know, you have kids coming into the business, you have businesses being sold off. Sometimes businesses lose money. How and where and what do you do? So if you can review that, it makes it easy for you to continue the family business. Because well, you what, mentioned a key thing there, especially uh, the next generation after you when they get married, and you've got yeah. a lot more children, True. a lot more spouses. Things change. Things change, and depending again how many kids and you know whether it's you have kids and girls in the house who are going to bring in their spouses, is the son in the house who's who's like you know do do you want his wife and his family to be involved? Those are all things that will only you can think about when they happen or they're about to happen. You can't plan that 30 years in advance because you don't know. And I'm going through that with my son coming into the family you now, into the business. And we had to go through this whole cycle again, which we did we were, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Yes. So, so if, again, on the channel, there's another video on what is a family constitution. For those who are wondering, what is it? 
a family constitution if countries can have it uh, why can't families have it yeah. you know, it's a roadmap at the end of the day it's, it's about the philosophy for the family yeah but the other thing is outside of just that clarity of running a business being part of the family you know the wealth part is also important isn't it in preserving the wealth protecting the wealth yes. uh, you know we won't get into figures but today you know the, the, you've got a sizable empire you know, uh, you know, in the past, whether it's yourself or your father, have been on the the rich list many times. Yeah. So, how do you deal with that with the next gen of wealth and n- new members coming in, spouses coming in? What, what's your thoughts around this whole wealth piece of money uh, from where you've come from and where you are today? Listen, it, the, when you have the next gen coming into a established family business, it's a challenge for them because they have everything, but at the same time, they are lost. They don't know which way to go. What I did is I did not <clears throat> give my son everything to say, okay, he will give him the information. Mm-hmm. He has the knowledge of what the family is all about, where is the wealth, what is the assets, how are we structured. Mm-hmm. However, <clears throat> give him the focus on one area only yes. and say, okay, this is your baby. You need to work on it. You need to earn your stripes to grow that business. And when you feel that you achieve some, you know, maturity in that business or you want to, then you bring him into the other side. Um, what I would not do uh, is like, okay, here's the wealth and here's the management of the, the entire family office and now you take over. He needs to earn his stripes. That could be disastrous. Well, <laughs> yes and no, depending, depending, the, yeah. depending, but at the same time, you know, you don't want to give a 23-year-old or 24-year-old complete responsibility. That is also unfair on his part because the pressure on the child also becomes too much. They need to go through process. They have to see booming markets. They have to see, you know, downward falling markets. Mm-hmm. And they need to learn how to cope up with all these ups and downs. And if they've worked in the family business for long enough, and then you share, you know, business by business information about. And, and what about the mindset part? Growing up, you know, you know, you're, with your vast experience, first generation, uh, you know, there's hardly any money in their pocket. It's a few dirhams to get yeah. from Mumbai to yeah, yeah, Dubai, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they worked hard, yeah. 100 plus hours a week, True. day in day out, to build something. Second generation see that. So they respect the hard work that's yeah, involved. Yeah. Third generation grew up with the wealth. You know, went to the best schools. Yes. They've got the best cars. They live in the best homes. So what do you do regarding the mindset of wealth, but also still working hard uh, and not becoming lazy yeah. and not having that fire in the belly to do something? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm going through that with my son and my daughter, both in, both in their uh, 20s now and they're coming into the family business. But you know what I like about this generation is they are a lot more aware. They don't take it for granted. Great. Yes, they, they've got the platform. They've got everything. Mm-hmm. But you can't blame them for that. That's right. I mean, they, they have it. They need to only understand it. And that, I think it is a, it is the, it is the job of the senior generation to share it with them. Mm-hmm. Because the more you hide from them, the more they get disgusted with the family. So that's why, why am I not understanding what you guys are doing? Mm-hmm. If you give them the open book and say, look, this is what it is. But it's not yours for, for you to take away now. Yes. You need to manage it. There is a process and there is some timeline that we are allowed to set in. They're aware. I mean, believe it or not, their knowledge and information that they have today is much more than I had when I was aware. Though my father, thank God, was a very open-minded person. He, When I walked into the family business, he opened his books and he said, this is what we are, this is what we're doing. And for you to now take it forward, yeah. I know a lot of people who struggle to understand where are they in the family business. What is the family business? How big is it? What am well, I? Some seniors don't want to tell them as well. That's They're it. They're scared, aren't they, to say, "Oh, by the way, yeah, our yeah. net worth could be a billion dollars." Yeah, yeah. they don't want to share. We don't. We don't want to tell you that. No, we don't want to yeah. share. We don't want to spend. We yeah. don't want to announce, and we don't want to give encourage you to give you even a small amount of money to to learn. Mm. So those kind of things are different today because with technology, with the communication, with knowledge that the, the, the millennials have. Uh, they are aware. They are a lot more aware of their value in the house, in the in the company. Mm-hmm. Only thing is, you have to give it to them. You can't just say, "Oh, I'll, I'll give it to you later." Yes, you have to trust them with some things, and you have to part that knowledge with them. M- moving on briefly, uh, I know it's getting a bit hot in no, here, right. right. <laughs> but just to give you an idea, we're on the 29th floor right. of the Taj Residence, right, yeah. uh, right. which is one of your projects. Right. Uh, as you can see, a beautiful view here behind us. Uh, tell us, how did this project come about? And the hotel is right next to us That's as well. Right. Yeah? The hotel is above us, yeah. or below us actually, yeah, 29th floor, so we're below us, uh, up and down. Um, so in 2012, um, you know, right after the, the 2008 crisis, I was sitting around and saying, okay, now what next? 
because you know we had the correction of the markets from 2008 to 2012. I was sitting around and I looked at what I'd done. And yes, we had lost money in the real estate in the 2008 bubble. And the reason we lost the money was because we gave it to developers and, and we invested with people that we thought were good and they never really delivered. So we, you know, we invested with them on trust mm -hmm. and they never delivered. The opportunity came in 2012 for me to buy a piece of land, a really prime piece of land in uh, downtown Dubai. And I was sitting there saying, okay, why do I have to invest with other people when I can do it myself? Right. And I've had experience of real estate. I've been doing real estate for 25 years, but not on a large scale. And at that time, I, I started gathering information. I did my research. I started to see what is not happening in the market. Mm -hmm. What I realized is there was not a lot of big developers or even niche developers doing anything that is of quality and size. They were all cookie cutter. They didn't want to produce product mm -hmm. which was simple, you know, small. It doesn't matter about quality because things were flying off the off the rack. They just wanted to go. Maybe like the fifty towers. I can see the, uh, this direction out exactly. the window. So, yes. But we we yeah. and so I created mm -hmm. a company called with a partner of mine, uh, with the money family. We said well, let us do something that is completely different. Mm -hmm. We will not compete with the market. We need to be niche. We need to take quality to the next level, mm -hmm. and that will take time. So we created our first building in downtown called the 118 downtown. Yeah. It is a very niche building, which is unlike anyone else. That we'll also make sure the details pop up now if you want to go and have a look at the website. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting project because uh, in, right in downtown, right next to the Dubai Mall, about 20 meters away now from Dubai Mall, uh, you have a building which is like a villa in the sky. Yeah. It's only four bedrooms, one apartment per floor. Ultra high finishes with a huge lobby, concierge services, valet services, whatever. It's like a proper uh, uh, condo in New York or in London where you have all the services and amenities there. And details to, to finishes and quality is but very private. Yeah, you say 20, very, 20, 28, uh, 28, 28 apartments in a 44 story building. Wow. Yeah. And uh, well, so one of the unique things is we raise the building by eight floors just so that everybody can get a perfect view of the fountains. Uh, when By the way, it's an excellent location. Yeah. You know, when you yeah. told me about it uh, not long ago, I had a chance to drive past and what a location. Right right next to Dubai Mall, Correct. fountain views, yeah. easy to get in and out of, of downtown. And we wanted to create something that's an address. Yeah. And that's why we didn't even spend time thinking about the name for the building. We said 118 downtown, that is the address. You know, the plot number was 118. We're in downtown. We want to create an identity not for a apartment to say this is our apartment. The whole building is wow. And 118 is what it is. Can I ask you how, how have you marketed it? Because it seems very private. You don't see it no. anywhere. There's no branding, PR. It, it is very private. Yes. It is. Is, it is. So have you sold it on a very personal one-to-one -one basis through, through contacts and so people the, you know? Exactly the strategy is that to make it word of mouth sale mm -hmm. rather than for plastering uh, billboards all over the city. Yeah. It is such a high end quality product that uh, anything, anybody who is interested, if you put the word and, and the, and the brochures in the right places, people will talk about it. That's exactly what we did. We sold a few and those are the people who went out and they were our brand ambassadors and they were the people talking about if you want quality and if you want different and you want size, this is it. We did not release one single advertisement in the newspapers. We did not want to create anything that would make it look as if it's you know, freely available and anybody and everybody can go and buy because the price tag was such that we were trying to attract maybe 1% of the world's population. So for our international viewers, price tag in dollar terms would be what, what approximately? It starts at $6 million for the lowest apartment yeah. and the duplex, which is a 12,000 is about $14 million. Okay. So those kind of things, when you sell, you have to do it very discreetly. Yeah. You have to do it on a, on a personalized basis mm -hmm. and we reach out to people when when and if they desire because these, these are not kind of things that you you buy right, right off the block got it you need it you want this is your requirement and if you fit your requirement this is what we do so it's an amazing experience for you it so was going from seeing uh, problems in the market seeing an opportunity there's always taking there's a always, niche area exactly. and, and, and building your first project i always believe yeah. in there's, there's always opportunity in crisis and if when i told you in 2012 when this when the land was being offered to me I was like, no, something is wrong here. Why is the price this this low? And firstly, why is this location is up for sale? Yeah. 
2012 was a, was a tough year for a lot of real estate companies and they had to pay down debt and they had to readjust their balance sheets. So there were people or companies who were selling their, their portfolio to get rid of it. And this was one of those locations that came in the market and it was available. And if I did not take the, the, the challenge at that time, I would have paid three times more today. Right. So it's, a, it's, it's always an opportunity. Quite so that experience has led to uh, then this another project that you've done here now with the residents in the hotel. True. So the, after the first one, which is the 118, uh, we got the opportunity to again uh, look at another project. And the same thing, I looked at uh, the market and said, let's do a study. Mm -hmm. We spent time on research, understanding the product, understanding the location. Uh, the same thing came out. Why is somebody not building high quality product on this side of town? Mm -hmm. Why is GLT not up to its mark? I mean, if you see the location, if you see the views, if you see the amenities, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But just because it was not built doesn't mean that, you know, nobody else can build it. When we did our research, we found out there's a, in GLD there are lots and lots of buildings having just one bedroom studios and two beds. And again, for the for people watching this who don't know, so JLT is only one area. Right. Opposite us is, is Dubai Marina. And then further down, we've got downtown. Right. And right behind us, we've got a place called Emirates Hills, Emirates Hills which Emirates. is like the Beverly Hills of Dubai. No, there's uh, a big other low, low rise uh, yeah. house market over there. So when you do the research and you find out that, you know, there is not much of the quality and size product available, we went and again attracted those kind of people. So same, the, the, the theory here was quality, amenities, finishes, and, but this time we did not do it the way we did in one time, or one, uh, 118. We didn't go with just the four beds and six beds. We said, no, this market is different, so let's get it away. But we uh, skipped the studio and the one beds. Right. We just focused a small quantity on two beds, but largely the three and four beds which are what family houses want Fantastic. when they want to have a family living in an apartment rather than in a villa because the difference between living in a house and, a, and an apartment block is less headache. So you still need the space. Yeah. If you are a family with two kids, you want that space, you want storage, you want amenities. Yeah. So what we've given here is, uh, I don't think anybody else in Dubai has done, is giving driver's rooms in the building where you can have a shopper living in the building, yeah. you have a massage room, you have a, uh, a treatment room, you have a huge swimming pool with a, and then there's on the same deck you have a huge ballroom to have um, you know parties or, or conferences or meetings. We actually have two meeting rooms in the lobby where if you want to work from home, you don't have to sit in your home and work. You can go down and it's great and create your own. And space. that's all then integrated with the hotel side as well. And then you complement the, the benefits of the hotel as well. Yeah. True. So you have the hotel right above you or below you, depending where you go, and you can get all the services served uh, on a la carte basis. So you get the benefit of the Taj, but you also have your own privacy and you have your own thing. And then we try to do a little more, be creative on the on the construction because the view, we get a panor panoramic view of 270 degrees. And hopefully you'll see a few views uh, come up. We'll be taking some shots uh, yeah. shortly, so you'll see those come so up. To encapture that view, we did not want to make it just a simple view. We wanted to encapture the, the entire 180 degrees. So we created these pods, which are these pods in the sky that jut out. And you can literally stand in that pod or in the balcony above the uh, above the pod, and you can see view, which is 180 degrees. Yeah. And coming on the main Sheikh Zayed Road, yeah. it's the first tower yes. in JLT that you see that True. stands out. And uh, look, you know, so you've been consistent with your location, haven't you? Location, the right location, 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 yeah. location. And I think to add to that, I would say it's quality, quality, quality. Yeah. People only go after location, but if you give a substandard quality. Eventually, people, uh, the consumer starts saying, you know what, I don't care about the location, I want also quality. But if you give location and quality together, that is a winning formula in the long run. So again, for people who are watching this, it's, it's a fantastic story with, with, with your family business. You can see how over three generations of the business from trading textiles has grown, diversifying right. into technologies with your, with your big satellite dishes yeah. <laughs> to where you are today. Yeah. And then moving into uh, property and real estate and construction to now hospitality as well. So what does the next 10 years look like? Where, what's your vision? Next 10 years will be a different kind of uh, story. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have to look at where the industries are going. And uh, for me personally, I feel the manufacturing and trading industry in this part of the world will have to move away. What will, what will grow is the technology, the services businesses, the, the sharing economy businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're focusing on hospitality, we'll focus on, on services. And those mean, that means whether it is creating a, a platform for trading, but on the, 
on the web, okay. trying to do online trading, and then you become a global player rather than a Dubai-based player only or Dubai-catered player. Uh, we will be looking at more industries which are agile, which are mobile, which can use resources not only from the UAE but from around the world. Mm -hmm. How do we use Dubai as a logistics hub? And what are the industries that will give Dubai the edge? Because Dubai started as a trading port. Right. Uh, and then it moved to the next level. But now, I think, like Singapore, like Hong Kong, every city is evolving to become, you know, a different city to, you know, like Singapore does banking and they do shipping. And so not standing lot. still, innovating, yeah. you know, going into the digital digital areas. Exactly. And, and growing, growing, growing. Down. What about with the next generation? What's important to you with the next generation of your family? So my kids, my, my daughter is working and she knew uh, that was a discussion that you know, she could have some work experience before she starts uh, coming back to the family business. My son worked with me for four years. He just quit last year and he started, started his own company. He's got a company called Chara Ventures and he has created a platform. Again, it was a service based, education based, knowledge based uh, platform that he's created and that is what his focus is on. Well, we look forward to interviewing him one day for one of our shows. Why not? Yes. So when you say it's, 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 a, it's a good case thing, when you say he quit, okay, the strong words. Yeah. Uh, is this, is it parked? Is it a transitional period, or uh, would you would you want to bring him back at least at a board level with no, the legacy involved, business? He is involved in the family. Okay. He's, he's yeah. involved on the board level, already. Right. Right. But he wants to be on his own, like I, what I did. Exactly like what you were yeah. He's doing similar. <laughs> he wants to yeah. find himself. He wants to create a Wonderful. venture, yeah. and then when he comes around the full circle, because he also wants to do something on his own that is yeah. his. Dad own. did it, so why can't I? And why shouldn't he? <laughs> why shouldn't he? You know? So, so if he wants to create something or she wants to create, my daughter wants to create something, we'll support them, uh, to whatever support we can give them. But they need to they need to stand up on their own with their own ideas yes. and grow the business. And when they feel that, look, you know, my business is this much, the family business is here. Do I want to work together? Do I want to be happy in this space? Do I want to merge the two? Mm -hmm. That only the time we will find out. So what do you do in your spare time? What keeps you uh, occupied? Uh Recreationally or recreationally, outside of business? Well, golf is a passion, yeah. travel is a passion, and a little bit of reading. Okay. That keeps me busy. And uh, I understand you're, you're, you're an active member of YPO. Correct. Maybe for viewers who don't know what YPO, could you tell us briefly, you know, what it is and how does that help you? So YPO, uh, is a young president's organization. And before that, I had, uh, I was the founding chair of YEO, which is now become EO, okay. the entrepreneurs organization. Both are non-profit based organizations out of the US and what they do is they encourage presidents, entrepreneurs, CEOs to learn, network, share knowledge. It's basically a platform that, that encourages people to get out there and share their ideas, uh, get into forums so they can share their, uh, their, their emotional uh, state of mind too. Because you need a sounding board, not only for business, but also for your That's what I was asking you because it, sometimes it could be lonely as an entrepreneur. And even in a family business, Correct. you could have underlying issues, but Correct. you don't know where to go. Yeah. So one needs a peer group. One needs some people call it a mastermind group. That's right. So this is exactly a peer group that you learn from each other's experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is a global organization. So depending on if you're traveling, if you have uh, universities and speakers mm -hmm. and conferences, you can go and learn about everything. I mean, today's buzzword, whatever it is, whether it's sustainability, whether it is scalability, whether it is um, you know, technology, these uh, groups organize conferences, talks, and members are of the same uh, mindset. They're all entrepreneurs, they're all CEOs. If you discuss ideas, if somebody's done that in South Africa, you want to bring it here, you share, you associate with them, uh, or you go and listen to see these, these, uh, these people, and you want to tie up, there are formats that you can do some kind of a tie up, and it basically encourages networking. And it helps me because you create a great group of friends, a great knowledge base that comes to you. At the same time, you have fun. We'll make sure some of these membership organizations also pop up. So get chance, because I've been a resource speaker for a lot of these organizations for many years. And I think it's very powerful. Yeah. Just, just for, it's a very private setting and learning from each other. Uh, with the time that we've got left, a lot of people go through learning in their life, get knowledge. Some apply it, some don't. Mm. Uh, and then we get to a stage where we want to get to becoming wise and yeah, having wisdom. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes we repeat our mistakes over and over again in all aspects of life sure. until we reach that, that enlightened uh, stage and getting wisdom. So it, with a few minutes we've got left, what wisdom can you give our viewers with your life journey, which has now become part of your philosophy? 
Well, for me, the, the, the wisdom I can part, I mean, not that I can give wisdom, but I can share my experience of um, how one has to take the journey. For me, I think my learning I had from my fathers and my, my seniors was you work to enjoy your work. You're not doing it just for the dollar value. You're not doing it for money. The minute you put the dollar value at it, you, you know, you lose out because what are you going to do? Yeah. You have to enjoy the process. For me, I've always enjoyed my work. I've always enjoyed that. I've, I've been passionate about what I do. And I'm not doing it because it's a hot buzzword or industry is hot and I want to make money. Yes, money is a motivator, but there is more to it. Mm-hmm. And what I've realized is you've got to enjoy life along the way. You can't wait to say, okay, I'm going to make this and I'm going to enjoy it. Of course. So if you can enjoy life along well, the way. Well, the gray hair start to stack up. Exactly. Or well, <laughs> no hair. <laughs> that you don't want. <laughs> no hair is the worst. Yeah. Um, so for me, it is enjoying life as, as it is. You take it as it is. And, uh, you know, goods and bads come together. And how do you, how do you manage them? And what do you do to make sure that, you know, life, work life, is as good as your personal life. A lot of people go out and stress themselves out with work. Uh, or sometimes they're in an industry which they don't, they're not happy. And they're struggling to be happy in the industry itself because the family was already in that business, of course. You have to take a call and say, you know, I don't want to be here. And because the worst thing you can do is I can put my son in an industry where he is not happy with. How much ever he tries, he will never succeed because he's not happy. But ultimately, that's what it's about, isn't it? It's about you happiness. need to have. Yeah, so you need to have the happiness index rather than the monitoring. Are oh, you happy? <laughs> right, then do you wake up in the morning, am I happy? You know, it's, you're right. Exactly. And the rest of the work, yeah, that's the main thing. I could spend hours talking to you, yeah. and hopefully we get a chance to do this again as uh, your enterprises and your, your family group uh, expands further. Sure. Well done, congratulations Thank with this so much, project guys. and all the yeah. others that you've Thank done. You. Thank you. And uh, again, leave some uh, comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, watch some of the other shows on, on the channel. And hopefully we get a chance to meet some of uh, Roger's other family members in the future on the Next Gen Entrepreneur Show. So thanks so much, Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks a lot.